Germany now says it will for the first time and after weeks of internal strife and harsh international criticism send some anti-aircraft weapon systems to Ukraine to help fight off Russia's invasion. Defense Minister Christina Lambrecht made the announcement at a meeting of defense and military leaders on Tuesday in Rammstein here in Germany. The U.S. airbase in Rammstein, Germany. This is where the United States and its allies pledged new packages of ever heavier weapons for Ukraine during a meeting on Tuesday that was hosted by U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. We don't have any time to waste. The briefings today laid out clearly why the coming weeks will be so crucial for Ukraine. So we've got to move at the speed of war. And I know that all the leaders leave today more resolved than ever to support Ukraine in its fight against Russian aggression. The day kicked off with a surprise. In a notable policy shift, Germany, which had been criticized for refusing to send heavy weapons to Ukraine, announced it would now send Gepard anti-aircraft systems. We've made the decision that it's now important to support anti-aircraft defense. That can be done with a Gepard, and it's exactly what's on the list of what Ukraine needs. And that is what we, coordinated with others, are now making possible. We'll continue doing this. Not everyone in Berlin welcomed the decision. I find it problematic. Germany doesn't even have enough military equipment for itself in the case of Putin totally losing control. I think it's important. Um, I also think that what the German government is doing is good. But I am also not sure if offering weapons is actually going to stop the war. I don't like how hesitant they've been. Ultimately, I would actually be for aggressive weapons, heavier machinery. In his closing remarks, Austin said the gathering between the U.S. and its allies will not be the last. Once a month, they'll meet to discuss Ukraine's defense needs to help them fight the Russian invasion. Now let's bring in Ralf Stegner. He's a member of the German parliament for Chancellor Olaf Scholz governing Social Democrats. Mr. Stegner, finally, after weeks of reluctance, internal coalition dispute and unusually sharp criticism from its allies and from Ukraine, Germany is now delivering a few heavy weapons to Ukraine. What prompted this U-turn by Olaf Scholz now? Well, I don't think that the impression is, is correct. We always said that we try to support the Ukraine with everything we can, which is uh, uh, responsible in terms of political, economic, financial, and military aid. And we do that uh, in very close uh, consulting process with our allies. And so we did this way. Uh, we are talking about defense uh, tanks. Uh, and uh, that was decided uh, because uh, the Ukrainians needed to defend themselves, anti-aircraft tanks. Uh, not offensive ones, mm. and, and therefore uh, I don't see a policy shift. And besides, uh, the second part we really have to uh, look at is um, that we have the Ukrainians as best as we can, but not um, enhancing the risk of uh, getting NATO or Germany being involved in the war itself. Well, nobody else seems to be worried that NATO uh, uh, gets involved in the war with, uh, if, if NATO members help Ukraine with, uh, with weapons. And, and also Germany continues to import Russian gas financing uh, uh, Putin's war. Isn't that inconsistent? Well, first of all, I don't think you're right with your uh, assumption, because I understand that President Biden and President Macron argue the, exactly the same way as Olaf Scholz does, and we are in very close talks about that, and um, that we need to get out of uh, energy imports from Russia as fast as possible. That's correct, but there are different situations in different countries how fast that can go, because sanctions should uh, be a punishment for the other side rather than bringing down our own industry. So we do that as fast as possible, uh, but it cannot be done from one day to the other. How worried are you that uh, after now uh, Putin decided to stop gas deliveries to Poland, Bulgaria uh, is on shaky ground there. Uh, if it, Russia turns off gas supplies uh, to, to Germany, what then? 
Well, actually, we're, uh, we're preparing for that case, but we don't expect it to happen. We see uh, what happens. The uh, fact is that everybody knows that we have to get out of the dependency on uh, Russian energy um, imports as fast as possible, and that's what our government is doing. And that was German parliamentarian Ralf Stegner from Chancellor Olaf Scholz, governing Social Democrat uh, Party. So uh, how important are these deliveries of anti-aircraft tanks to Ukraine? Let's discuss that with Frank Ledwich. He's a former military intelligence officer and now lectures in military capabilities and strategy at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. Frank, you've been following this war closely. What's your reaction to Germany's deci decision to supply heavy weapons finally? Very important decision. Concerning the weapons themselves, the Gepards, they're, they're an old design, but they've been modernized. Uh, they've been out of service from, in the German army only, only for about 10 years, and the, many armies still use them. They're extremely formidable, short range, but if you're a pilot, there's nothing you can do about them if you get near. Same applies, by the way, to the British uh, anti-aircraft vehicles they sent. But it's not only directly effective, but the possession of it keeps, keeps, keeps aircraft away. It's a deterrent. But what's significant, Gerhard, is that the most recent tranche of weapons deliveries from the West, not only NATO, the Swedes as well, are interesting for another reason. Uh, all of these now are NATO standard items. They're different from the Soviet stuff that, that uh, East European nations have been passing on and will continue to. Now, there's also training implications in this because you can't just hand over these, these Gepards and, and expect people to use them. They're radar-guided guns. They're quite complex. It, it will take a few weeks to train on that. So I would be fairly certain that there'll be a training package. But that's going to continue. So what we're seeing now is NATO standard equipment being sent institutionally, continually to the Ukrainians. To, and that, that does change things, I think, because it winds NATO even closer into the conflict. Uh, uh, zooming out and to get a more general picture of that conflict, Russia claims it's making advances in several parts of eastern Ukraine. What are you seeing? Are Ukrainian forces losing their grip in the east there? I don't think so. For the second time in a week, the Russians d declared that they captured Kremina in the, in, the, in the far east of the, the salient where in the Donbass where fighting has taken place. Of course, what they don't announce are little villages and towns that the Ukrainians are nibbling back at in counterattacks. I think from the Russian perspective, it's quite a disappointing uh, first week or 10 days of this particular campaign. They've been pressing all along that 500 or nearly 500 kilometre front. They've been looking for breakthroughs. That's what they do. That's what anyone would do. But they simply don't really have the mass to exploit any breakthrough if they were to make it. And the, the problem they face now is that they're getting into heavily fortified Ukrainian towns, Severo, Donetsk. They'll soon, well, if they, if they succeed, they'll be getting towards Kramatorsk. Ukrainians know they've been coming. And what the Ukrainians will do there is create other Mariupols. Fortified towns will take a lot of time and a lot of casualties even to come close to reducing. Now, the U.S. Secretary of Defense uh, said yesterday he thinks Ukraine can win this war. Do you agree? As with everything else, Gerhard, what constitutes winning? From the Ukrainian perspective, of course, that would be expelling all the invading forces. What they certainly can do, I think, at the moment, absent any significant escalation, is hold the Russians off. They may have to give some ground there in the east. Obviously, they've lost that corridor down to Crimea. The issue is over the next week's months and yes as secretary blinken hinted possibly years is whether the, the ukrainians can gather enough force to retake the ground that they have lost that's a very different matter but what this is as he said today blinken said today or yesterday it's a long-term prospect now we need to look at it strategically so we'll see the answer is on the battlefield and we don't know it yet frank ledwich there thank you very much and DW Russia correspondent Emily Sherwin is here in the studio with me. Emily, huge discrepancies in the numbers of the fallen on the Russian sides, depending on who you ask, right? How is Russia handling the, the numbers coming out of this conflict? Well, the Kremlin is tightly controlling these numbers. We've only had the Ministry of Defense in Russia publish numbers of fallen soldiers on the Russian side twice, the last time at the end of March, when they said just over 1,300 um, soldiers were killed. And an example for that tight control is, you might remember it, the sinking of the Moskva flagman, uh, the, the ship, which was the flagman of the, of the Russian fleet in the Black Sea. There was a lot 
lot of mystery around that. So initially, Russia said that the crew was fully evacuated. There was, though, a wreath at the ceremony for the ship, which said to the crew and the ship, which uh, journalists noted. And investigative uh, journalists also did a lot of digging. They found posts from parents who were um, talking about their children being missing. And they put the number of dead or dead around 37 or 40 people. And only last week, there was an official statement saying that one um, crew member died and that 27 are missing. So it's unclear, even just on that example, whether that's the full picture. And it's also common for mothers or relatives of soldiers to be kind of silenced, put pressure on. And um, apparently, Russia is also using mobile crematoria in Ukraine, including for their own. We heard in the report about two fallen soldiers on the Russian side. What more do we know about the people fighting Putin's war? Well, we know that uh, there are some reports of conscripts being involved, even though the Russian side has denied that. Um, many are on contracts. And military experts have been saying that actually many of the people who have been dying um, are from um, regions far away from Moscow. So poor regions, including Buryatia, which is near Lake Baikal um, in Siberia, and also Dagestan in the Caucasus. And many of the people there um, are from non-Russian ethnic groups. So that means they look very different from Ukrainians. That could be a factor. And some experts actually ex estimate that about half of the people who have died are from Buryatia, that region that I mentioned, one of the poorest regions in Russia. And um, journalists there have been saying that people are actively signing up in order to have kind of a purpose for their lives in some ways, but also, you know, for economic regions, uh, reasons as well. Now, the Kremlin, of course, tries to crush any sign of dissent, especially when it comes to this war. Do you expect criticism to grow as more Russians die in the war? Well, it's hard to know. You know, we have these surveys saying that there's widespread support. Sociologists point out that surveys during wartime are difficult anyway. Um, I'm very surprised to see in that report that people were so openly critical because, you know, even before the war, people were very afraid to um, talk about their criticism of the Kremlin or of Putin, especially when it comes to speaking to Western journalists. And there's been this crackdown on civil society, which is, of course, going to make it difficult for any kind of movement to consolidate. For example, there's a committee of soldiers mothers that works in Russia, and uh, they've had trouble working, including um, because of a new law where you're not allowed to spread so-called fakes about the war. And of course, that means that even calling the war a war is a fake. PW's Emily Sherwin, thank you so much for those insights.